This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 88. Hi, I'm Michael Port, author of Book Yourself Solid. And if you're looking for a solid and surefire way to rapidly increase the rate of your personal and professional growth, you found it. It's the Read to Lead podcast with my friend, Jeff Brown. I think that forgiveness and the example of it is what leaders, both in corporate America and politics and in nonprofits, what leaders forget that that is one of the most important lessons that you can pass on to people. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hi there, and welcome to the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth, where we sit down each week with a successful and inspiring business book or nonfiction author and talk about their latest book and their unique insights on things like leadership, personal development, productivity, career, marketing, business, or entrepreneurship. And in today's episode, we'll be chatting with Dana Perino, author of And the Good News Is, Lessons and Advice from the Bright Side. I plan to ask Dana about practices that leaders can leverage to foster an environment more conducive to sharing opinions and speaking up, the importance of feeding your brain and the impact it can have on your career, methods for improving civility in all areas of life, and a lot more. If you've yet to become a part of our private Facebook group and join other listeners to discuss some of these same topics and challenges, I encourage you to do so. It's as simple as texting the phrase, read to lead, no spaces, to 33444. That's read to lead to 33444. You'll get a text back asking you to supply just your email address. And once you do that, we'll add you to the private Facebook group exclusively for Read to Lead podcast listeners. And please consider visiting our sponsors. There's Blinkist, a free app that delivers Business book summaries in both audio and text form. Read to lead podcast dot com slash Blinkist to find out more about them and the educational site Linda dot com, where for a limited time you can get access to 100 percent of their video tutorials on all kinds of topics by visiting read to lead podcast dot com slash Linda. Dana Perino is a Fox News contributor and co-host of one of the most popular shows on cable television, The Five. She was the first Republican woman to serve as the White House press secretary and served for over seven years in the Bush administration, including at the Department of Justice after the terrorist attacks on 9-11. She is also the author of the book and the good news is lessons and advice from the bright side. Well, as uh, you no doubt know, Mark Marin of the WTF podcast recently welcomed President Obama onto his show, a milestone for podcasting. So I thought Mm -hmm. not to be outdone, we'll have former White House Press Secretary Dana Perino on our show. So, so Dana, yeah, thank you. Yeah, not to be outdone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking the time and very, very excited to have you here. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored. This is a new way of communicating and I've been following you uh, ever since I learned about the podcast. I'm very oh. impressed with what you're able to put out there and I think it's very useful for people. So I'm honored to be invited. Well, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. I'm curious to know as we begin here, Dana, what was it about uh, your upbringing and your environment that instilled in you this this outlook you're known for, this sort of glass half full type of view on life? You know, I believe that it's a combination of factors, right? I, Mm. I, I am a believer in that nature versus nurture situation, meaning that I'm a believer in thinking it through over and over. And I think it is a combination of things. Um, I do believe I'm a naturally optimistic person. (laughs) But part of that, I think, was watching my grandfather in particular. Mm. Um, He was a rancher in Newcastle, Wyoming. He was a young man that was one of seven children on a ranch um, who then went and fought in World War II in the Pacific, came back on his first night back um, stateside. His friends had arranged a blind date for him, and he said, I'm not going on a blind date. (laughs) And this woman that had been set up on the blind date, she was a nursing student outside of Philadelphia. And she said, I would never go on a blind date. <laughs> but they, their friends prevailed, and that 
uh, blind date turned into my grandparents. Mm. And my grandmother, who grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, kind of a city East Coast girl, left with my grandfather two months later to Newcastle, Wyoming, where they had to share a home with um, one of his siblings and his wife. And then they built this ranch into something that was just so remarkable so that as a kid, I get there and my grandfather is just filled with gratitude and optimism Mm. and reminding us every day that you should give thanks every day that we get to have this lifestyle, that Mm. we live in this country, that we get to have the freedom to take off in the middle of the day and go fishing if we want to. You know, the office was his saddle. And I, I revered him. And I write about that par- partly because I write about that in the book because when I was going to start my book, it sort of starts at age 35, right? And mm. I'm the first Republican woman press secretary. And my editor said, you can't just show up at age 35 as the first <laughs> Republican woman press secretary. How did that happen? <laughs> And I look back and I think if I had to pick one person that made me an optimistic person, it would be my grandfather, amongst others, but he would be the, the number one choice. Well, I, I want to love on your parents for, uh, for just a moment here. The thoughtfulness and intentionality, I think, that mm-hmm. your parents put into every aspect of your, of your upbringing uh, is truly to be admired and, and an example for parents everywhere, I think. One of my favorite stories, Dana, is, is the tradition that, that your dad began when, when you were in the third grade. Yes. I do think that my dad, who was one of three boys, and I don't think there had been a daughter born to the Perino side of the family in a couple of generations. And so Mm. when my sister and I came along, that was a pretty big deal. (laughs) Um, But my dad had instincts. You know, I think all dads want their best for their children and their daughters. Mm. Um, I think my dad had particular instincts about growing up in the West, needing to make sure that my sister and I understood that we could do anything that we wanted to do. Mm. We could stay on the ranch if we wanted to. We could go uh, into politics. We could travel the world. We could do anything that we wanted to do. And I missed my dad terribly when he'd go to work. I didn't know it then, but I realize it now that the interaction I had with my dad early on actually helped me become a a better professional woman in the future. Mm. So what do I mean by that? If you look at this one scene that I have in the book, I'm with President Bush on Marine One. He asked me a tough question about um, a situation that we were all dealing with, and he wanted my opinion. My opinion, I knew, was very unpopular uh, amongst the senior staff of the White House. And I don't even know if the president really wanted to hear it, but I wasn't afraid to give it. Hmm. And I remember I convinced the president that I was right, and my position prevailed, and that's the how we decided to handle the situation. And in that moment, I flash back to the third grade <laughs> when because I loved this and craved this attention from my dad, he created a tradition with me. So I had to read the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post every night before he got home from work and then be prepared to discuss two articles that I had chosen <laughs> you know, before dinner. And we would sit at the kitchen table and I would talk about the articles. And I don't really remember what I chose. I mean, probably <laughs> could have chosen nonsense. But I did love Ronald Reagan. So that was you know, one of my perennial favorites. Um, and my dad would gently play the devil's advocate and he would help me think things through. And it was a place where I could confidently express my opinion where I wasn't going to be criticized. And every young woman, when she grows up, if she's working, she will encounter a dominant male figure in the workforce. Mm. Even if Hillary Clinton becomes president, like this is always going to be true. <laughs> and women have to figure out a way to express themselves confidently. And what I wrote about over Father's Day is that I really think that that intentionality, as you point out, of what my dad decided to do then, he didn't know that then I would end up being the White House press secretary. Hmm. But I think that he knew that it would help me be a better thinker, which then if you're a better thinker and a good reader, then you're more apt to succeed. And as awesome as that is, when I, when I think about what newspapers are filled with in, in 2015, is, is that adv- advice you would give to a parent today, or, or would you alter that in some way? I would absolutely suggest it. Um, now, there's different ways to, to figure that out, right? <laughs> because there's, if you go online, you never know what you're going to find. But sure. I think there's actually even better ways to do that now. A, a parent that is wanting to do something like this can do so with some ability to pick and choose and to put in some filters and to decide what sort of content would be most helpful. You know, a lot of parents today are very much making sure that their children in America are growing up to be good, productive, worldwide citizens, that they Mm -hmm. give a lot back. And we know the millennial generation is like that, and their children will probably be like that too. So there could be themes. You know, I'm I'm for the family book report. Um, (laughs) And I also just think dinner, right? Like part of that whole thing, the lead in to um, my evenings every night was like reading the papers with my dad was that my mom was finishing putting dinner together and then we ate dinner together as a family. 
so the, to the extent possible that families can still do that, I still I think that that's really great. And then the show that I do, The Five, is really like having a big dinner conversation every night. You know, and I crave that. I love it. It's fun. It's sometimes tense, but it's always interesting, and I learn something every day. And I think that's what parents also can do. Like, my dad gave me a sense of curiosity. And if you're a curious person, you're probably never going to be bored. And if you're not bored, that means that you're not getting into any trouble. You know what I mean? (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Well, the book is filled with with fantastic advice uh, for life and career and and leadership. And and Dana breaks these down into uh, a few uh, areas she calls quick fixes is one, Mm -hmm. good habits, big picture. And starting with quick fixes, uh, explain, Dana, this phenomenon called uh, up-talking. It's one that I don't think I've heard anybody else address, and I, I'm glad that you are. What I like to do with audiences when I talk about this is, is to say that we all, as, in, as responsible adults, have a responsibility then to the young people in our lives, um, whether it's your children or a young employee. There's this weird way of talking that young people have adopted. It's kind of like the Valley Girl days of old, but... Hmm. Right now, so up talking, I describe it as every sentence ends like a question because then they don't have to own anything that they say, <laughs> right? Because it's, it's just, they're just straightening questions. Right. <laughs> this is something that starts because young people are kind of you know, testing the waters, like mm. trying to see like if they can express themselves in a way that is um, acceptable to their peers and, or to their elders. Then it takes hold, right? And then it becomes like a fad. It's a kind of a fashion thing. It's the in, in way to talk. Often that is broken between high school and college. I'm actually seeing it in the workplace now, all the way through college. And it's not just related, it's not just young girls that are doing it anymore. I mean, young men are starting to talk like this as well. And I am convinced that up talking is what is preventing a lot of young people from advancing in the workplace. Because you can imagine, I would never promote somebody that talk like that. I wouldn't want to put them in front of a client. And the thing is, is that a lot of young people, they have no idea that they're doing it. It sounds so normal to them. Right. And so what I say is that you need to find a way to privately address this with either your loved one, your niece, your nephew, your children, their friends, the people that work for you in a private, safe way and tell them that they can find their strong voice. And once they can do that, it's a little power center. I said, like right below your sternum, you just push on that a little bit mm. and speak. Speak like you mean it, and it will make a big difference to your career. Well, I was fortunate enough, Dana, to, for a number of years, 14, 15 years, have a leader in the workplace when I was working a regular nine-to-five type job who really empowered us to not be afraid to speak up and share our our opinions, much like your dad encouraged you to do. Uh, What are some of the practices, practical practices, leaders can leverage to help create an environment more conducive to sharing opinions and and speaking up? You know, I learned a lot about that from Dick Cheney and Mm. from Don Rumsfeld. Two people that most people think, what? How could you learn anything from them? (laughs) I learned a lot from them. Mm. These are two men that did pretty amazing things for their country and agree or disagree with their policies. They held amazing positions and were able to um, lead big organizations many times through changes or through strife. One of the things that both of them said is that they learned that as leaders in a meeting, for example, the most important thing that they could do was to say nothing. Mm -hmm. I used to watch Dick Cheney in um, policy meetings with um, the staff, and then then we would go in for senior policy time with the president, and he would be very quiet. (laughs) If he ever did speak up, you can bet your bottom dollar that he was going to ask the toughest question. Later on, I I read an interview that he did in which he was asked, like, you know, you're always considered to be this the, the guy with no, a man of few words, like, is it just because you're you know, an introvert? And he said that, no, it was a conscientious decision because he realized that when a leader speaks up in a meeting, it immediately quells the discussion amongst other people. Mm. So that staff feels like, well, I don't want to say what I really feel because <laughs> he's already played it, you know, laid down his cards mm. and I don't want to be embarrassed around him. And I'll just figure out another way to you know go around and try to get my message across. And so, I think one of the best ways is for leaders is to sit back and listen and to let a discussion go on so that people aren't afraid to give their opinion. Does that make sense? Yeah, that same leader I worked with did that very effectively. He pulled me aside one day and said, from now on, Jeff, you're going to lead the meetings. That way I can just sit back and listen and people are going to be more likely to speak up. Whereas if I speak first, that's that's going to be less likely. Yep. Well, when it comes to good habits, uh, Dana details a number of excellent examples in the book. Share, Dana, what you learned from one of your previous bosses about 
things like sharing the credit, taking the blame, and uh, in particular, exercising forgiveness. Mm. I learned so much from President George W. Bush, and in a lot of ways, he became like a second father to me. Mm. And I'm so pleased to say that we're good friends. Sticking up for others when they didn't know it was happening is something that, um, you know, and not asking for credit for it. It's something that's a story that I told about how we protected this young woman reporter who had been working very hard every day for months. She hadn't had a chance to ask the president a question at a press conference, but a day arrived and that was going to be her day. So we're getting ready to go to the press conference. I've got the seating chart. And all of a sudden, my assistant came in. He says, excuse me, ma'am, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but ABC is changing the lineup. And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, they're going to send this new male reporter in instead of her. The president said, well, who's that? And I said, well, <laughs> sir, I don't really know him because he comes from Capitol Hill and he's just, he's a big hire for them. I'm assuming they're wanting to give him a little bit of exposure, but she's been here every day and she works her butt off. I don't think this is fair. And he said, I don't either. He said, do we, do we have to call on him? Now, the Bush White House is very much a, a, of the traditional sort that we called on everybody. Yeah. Um, it was the first time ever, though, that the president and I, in collusion, <laughs> with a little wink and a nod, he avoided um, taking the guy's question the entire time. Now, we didn't put out a press release that says, oh, look, the president, you know, protected a young woman today. Um, <laughs> but it was about eight months later that I saw that her at a dinner and I said, hey, do you remember this day? And we had a nice laugh about it. And I always think about how she'll always know that the president of the, of the United States had instincts to protect her. And, and I like that. And I try to embody that when I can, you know, sticking up for people, especially if you see bullying in the office, even if it's not your place to say anything, you know, you have an obligation to say something in some way to do something, but you don't have to like write a press release about it or tweet about it or something <laughs> like that and try to get credit. I also saw the president pass on credit when major world events happened that went to, um, positively. So for example, when the hostages were released in Colombia in 2008, I went in and said, oh, Mr. President, can I tell the press that you got the call and the CIA director said this and that? And he said, no, 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 I don't need any credit. Make sure that President Uribe gets all the credit because there was a larger goal. Okay, we were trying to get the Colombia Free Trade Agreement passed and the president didn't need the credit. Uribe did because one of the complaints was that the hostages weren't, hadn't been freed. Once they were free, that that took away that argument. But the president didn't want to see his name in the headlines. And I thought that showed remarkable restraint. And then when you talk about forgiveness, you know, the president and all politicians, I think, have to exercise a certain amount of that every day. And I think that forgiveness and the example of it is what leaders, both in corporate America and politics and in nonprofits, what leaders forget that that is one of the most important lessons that you can pass on to people. Because bad things happen all day at the office, right? It's not easy. Hmm. Business is tough. Politics is tough. People throw sharp elbows. Now with social media, people say mean things all the mm. time. And you can absolutely be swamped and overwhelmed by negativity, mm. and it can prevent you from being able to do your work. And the president knew that about me when a predecessor of mine wrote a negative book about him, and I was so upset, and he called me into his Oval Office at 6.40 in the morning one day, and he asked me to forgive him. And I said, well, can I throw him under the bus first? <laughs> and he said, no, um, you cannot, but I don't want you to live bitterly. And then when I was leaving, and this is another thing about him and good leaders, I think, know their people better than they know themselves. As I was leaving the Oval Office, he said, hey, by the way, I don't think you'd ever do this to me. And I thought, oh, that's what was really bothering me. Mm. And so I always loved thinking about um, having that close a relationship with the president of the United States that he knew that I needed to be told that he didn't think I was going to be disloyal to him. Wow. What, what great insight. Well, now to, to some of the big picture items. Uh, one I was curious of asking about, how, how has feeding your brain, as you put mm -hmm. it in the book, benefited you and, and your career, would you say? Well, feeding my brain, I talk about... Um, you know, reality TV is kind of popular right now, especially mm -hmm. for younger people. And I tell people like an hour a day, that's all you can should give to your brain. Like you are <laughs> the only thing you have in, that you can really control in your life is how you take care of yourself. And filling it with junk, filling your mind with junk is a sure way to get your brain fat and lazy. <laughs> um, but I understand sometimes I like to just chill out too. But I learned, recently learned something from Peggy Noonan, who William Sapphire, who was a great uh, speechwriter, told her once, do not ever feel bad about spending time reading. Reading is what helps you think better. And I was so glad to hear that because in my job right now, I actually have to do a lot of thinking. And sometimes it feels like you're kind of idle. You know, I'm not writing emails. I'm not, I'm not frantic about anything. And I'm thinking and I'm, I'm reading different points of view. And I'm trying to come up with how I think about something or how I might express that 
in a way that allows five other people to, or four other people to also get their opinions in in a four minute <laughs> segment. Um, yeah, I mean, physically taking care of yourself with good nutrition and exercise is important, but I also feel like finding a way to be as well-rounded as possible. I think of my reading as an all-you-can-eat buffet. And some mornings I wake up, I'm like, hmm, I think I'll start with the fruit. Then I'll walk back, I'm like, oh, I need a little more protein. I need, you know, sometimes it's hard. I get the New York Post at home. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard not to go not to go to that first because that tastes delicious, <laughs> right? I'm like, I got to do the hard slog through the editorial pages before I can go to the New York Post. <laughs> I love that. One of my favorite Jim Rohn quotes is, you are the average of, of the five people you spend the most time with. And I'm curious to know what are some of your suggestions, Dana, for growing your network and raising the bar a bit in regards to the people you surround yourself with? Yeah, it's not always easy, right, to um, avoid having negative people in your life. Right. Sometimes they're your family, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Sometimes you've got to move far away. Um, <laughs> It's easy. It, it, everybody wants to be popular, mm. okay? So because that feels good. That's just human nature. But then I think also at the office, especially for younger people, sometimes like the the cool kids that go to coffee every day at three o'clock, and you can get into a negative spiral of gossip and negativity that your bosses do see. Mm. The other thing I love about writing this book, and I got a great compliment from Megan Kelly's husband, Doug Brunt. He said this is a book about surrounding yourself with people of character and. I thought about like he's right. So there's my grandfather, my parents, my sister in particular. Um, I meet my husband on an airplane, and what attracts me to him, of course, is the British accent. But um, <laughs> also a man of amazing character who came from a family of amazing character, President George W. Bush. You know my colleagues now, and so I guess I'm a little bit older, so I don't care as much about popularity. And I've achieved great things. I've had really great career success. So. When you are in public relations and you become the White House press secretary, there's pretty much nowhere to go up from there. So you move on. And part of moving on is just figuring out a way to meet and, and be around really smart, great people. I have found, especially in public relations, that one of the best things for me to do as a follower of some of these people and also the, and to get myself into their realm is to compliment them. You know, I read a lot. So sometimes I, well, I've actually just recently, I read about a, the Supreme Court decision about disparate impact, which I'm like, how am I going to talk about this on TV? Disparate <laughs> impact. How do you explain it? Well, I went and I read uh, Bill McMorris uh, on the Federalist uh, website. He had written a piece about it. And I, 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 I knew a friend of his. And so I asked him, I said, do you mind giving me Bill McMorris's email address? And he did. And I sent him a note of compliment. And I said, in all my years of working in politics and government, I never understood that issue until I read your piece. Hmm. And now I have a new friend and a new source. Okay. Yeah. Because now I can contact him and say, well, what does this particular thing mean when the Supreme Court ruled on X or Y? Can you walk hmm. me through that? So I benefit from not only having a new friend, but from also getting a really smart person willing to take my call. <laughs> Well, speak to the issue uh, of the lack of civility in politics these days, if you don't mind, Dana. Cable news often takes heat for being part of the problem. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on, on what we can do in this country, particularly, to improve civility? Well, I, did make, I came to a conclusion in my book. It took me a while to get there. <laughs> but it's that <laughs> after speaking for so many other people for so long, I now am only responsible for my own comments. Mm. And I found it very freeing. Because for a while, anytime somebody said something that was caustic or mean or rude, I would feel as a conservative or a Republican, on, if, if it was said by someone on that side of the aisle, I would feel a responsibility to own that comment. And I finally decided that I actually don't have to own their comment. And that has freed me up to just be myself. Like I always say, that if I say, ever say something that needs uh, an apology, I hope I am willing to apologize, but I don't ever want to put myself in that position. And so I think it's a more personal responsibility in what I say. So I have decided that every time you open your mouth, you're making a choice and you can be sarcastic and you can say that funny little thing that will make your five friends laugh, <laughs> right. but it might be really offensive to other people. And now with a public platform, I'm, I am mindful of that. And so I try to keep in mind something that I did at the White House podium, which is when I was up there taking questions from a, a press corps that might've been frustrated with me that day, I would always keep in mind if President Bush were watching me right now, would he be proud of me? And if the answer was no, then I didn't say it. Mm. And I kind of think of that now. 
I guess I could imagine if the president were in Dallas watching the five, would he wince at something I said? And I would be mortified if he did. Uh. <laughs> you had one little secret, though, that I appreciated hearing about uh, mm-hmm. from behind the podium, right? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of reveal a little stress reliever <laughs> in the book. I mean, can you, if, you, if you thought of, like, name a hundred things that you thought Dana Perino would never do, <laughs> that would be one of that them. That would be one of them. There were a couple of reporters, in particular one, who used to peacock around all the time. He was mm. just such a jerk and sometimes just when i had to sit there and smile and think about the president watching me behind under the podium out of the view of everyone i would just flip that guy the bird (laughs) and i felt terrible and i couldn't even believe that i actually was going to reveal it in the book but i thought that when i wrote it i said this is my one shot to tell people that this is how you can become the white house press secretary (laughs) right you don't have to go to harvard Right. You don't have to go to some elite school. Mm. You don't have to have family connections. A lot of people think that I must have grown up in Texas, so I knew the Bushes. When I say I'm from Wyoming, they just assume that the Cheneys got me my job. Mm. Truth is, I'd never met any of them until after 9-11, when I came back to Washington to work there. And I loved my time in Washington. I loved learning from those leaders. Sometimes working in television feels a little um, like cotton candy. Mm-hmm. Right? It melts on contact. You don't realize if you're having an impact. But it's been so gratifying to me to travel around the country on my book tour and to have people, both genders, all ages, come through the table and say, thank you so much. And I had a young woman in Vegas uh, who's about to go to law school in Virginia this fall. She's 29 years old. She said, I'm so old to be going to law school. I said, no, you're perfect. <laughs> this is a perfect book for you. And she looked up at me and she started crying. I said, oh, don't cry. I'm going to cry. But she said, you have no idea what it means to have an inspirational leader like you Mm. speaking with such grace and dignity. And I thought, Oh my gosh, what I'm doing actually is does matter (laughs) now. So it's a lot more than cotton candy. Mm. Well, how has your work in Africa and specifically Mm. Dana, the group mercy ships impacted your perspective on life? Well, I always say that that's good. That's um, perspective with a capital P when you (laughs) go to mercy ships, like we went to Congo, they do not waste a dollar and they do their work with joy. And in fact, I just today got a hospital ship update. Hmm. On the day we were in Congo, it was an assessment day. That means the first day before the ship starts their surgeries. Mm -hmm. 7,000 people showed up and stood in line patiently and quietly waiting to see if their ailment could be cured. And they took as many people as they could. Wow. The number of cleft palates that they fix, of course, is amazing, but they are doing things, um, reconstructive work on people's faces. And I just loved the experience. And it's a great reminder that no matter where I've gone in the world, everybody wants to be more like America. Mm. Um, And there's a reason for that. We're a generous people. And it is good to get out of America once in a while and be reminded that a caring heart actually can help make your life much more meaningful than sitting on Twitter all day. Um, (laughs) Getting out. And I have to do that sometimes. I pull myself out of it. And in fact, I'm going to go back to Africa later this year and talk about the importance of energy security Mm. um, because people need to have access to their resources so that they can actually have lights and energy and try to um, have some of the benefits of a more modern lifestyle, like for things like water, Mm. you know, and lights to read by at night. So that's been important to me. And I learned that also from the bushes, which is to, if you're born in America, you have an obligation to help others around the world because we are so Mm. blessed. And I feel like either through government, but, more often through the nonprofits, you actually are seeing a huge difference that Americans are making around the world. Well, I want to ask you uh, some questions not directly related to the book, if I may. Uh, I'd love to know if there's a book or two that you've read, Dana, or maybe you're currently reading that have impacted you, and, and maybe if you can share why or how they've, they've impacted you as they have. Of course, it's one of my favorite questions, and this we could do an entire podcast on this. <laughs> um, I'm a big reader. I really can point to several books. I talk about one in my book um, that made a difference to me, and that was by Peggy Noonan. It's called What I Saw at the Revolution. Mm. That is an amazing book that helped a woman like me sort of realize, oh, it's okay to think like I do and to be a conservative woman and to have grace and dignity like a Peggy Noonan. More recently, I have read um, some great books. I love novels. And I'm trying not to beat myself up that I love the novel, right? Mm. Because a a lot of people I know, smart people, read biographies. I just get bored sometimes with a lot of biographies. (laughs) But recently, I read a couple of nonfiction works that I loved. Um, Superpower by Ian Bremmer. Mm -hmm. Um, It's about three choices for America's role in the world. Uh, I've gotten to know him. uh, I respect him. I 
really couldn't stand the conclusion. I couldn't believe it. I got to the end of the book, and I, 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 he, made, he makes a choice of what he thinks America should do, and I was shocked by it. Mm. Um, but that's good, right? Because I called him up. I said, what do you mean? Um, <laughs> we had a nice conversation about it. But I loved it because it made me think. I also just recently read a book by Ann Patchett. And she's a wonderful, amazing novelist. Mm. But she wrote a book um, that's a collection of her nonfiction work. And it's called This is a Story of a Happy Marriage. She writes about the writing process and about the important stories of her life that she has covered that have made a big difference, um, either had an impact or um, changed minds or even just like observations about life. I think the sentences are so beautiful. I really love that book. Mm. And then my favorite novel I recently read was All the Light We Cannot See. Um, It's Mm. about World War II. And I have to say this book is like a work of poetry. (laughs) It was really wonderful. I've also recently read Rules of Civility, We Are Not Ourselves. And I'm reading one right now. And, you know, sometimes I can't remember (laughs) the name of the book. I'm in New York now, so I get a lot of galleys. So the pre-publication copy. So sometimes it doesn't even have a cover on it. So I couldn't even (laughs) tell you what the cover is. But it's written by Jonathan Weissman, who's a New York Times reporter. I've known him for years. I didn't know that he had a desire to write fiction. And it Uh is his his first book. And I love being able to have the time to read. And I'm not going to beat myself up for it as William Sapphire. Amen to that for sure. (laughs) I wanted to ask you too, I know that, you know, standing before the press every day, I can't imagine anything more pressure filled or stressful than that. So I I have to believe that, that, that giving a public talk to an audience that wants you to succeed is a piece of cake by comparison, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'd be curious to know what are some tips you would have for delivering an impactful and memorable public talk? I think two things. One I talk about in the book, one of my favorite pieces of advice was from my speech coach in college who said that it's okay to have butterflies in your stomach as long as you make them fly in formation. I love that. Yeah, me too. (laughs) And I've actually had people come through the line saying, oh, I'm so nervous, but I'm making my butterflies fly in formation. Because it's just a way to exercise a little self-control over what is a very natural biological feeling. Mm. You are going to feel nervous. That's what what you're meant to. You know the number one fear in all of America to this day, and for decades, it has been public speaking. Right. It's not terrorism or uh, economic fears. It's actually public speaking. Another thing I think is really, really important is to know your audience. You know, so what I gave a speech to the Mississippi Dental Association not long ago. Well, you know what? If you're going to be invited to give a speech to them, then you better learn a little bit about them. <laughs> How many people are in the organization? Mm. Um, what are their challenges? What are their goals? If you can understand your audience a little bit more, you'll be able to connect with them. Then the other thing, the last thing on, I could go on about this forever, but <laughs> if I had to pick three, it would be, you know, getting your nerves un- under control, knowing your audience. The third thing is for any audience, you just, you have to speak like yourself. I didn't know it would be a compliment after I, when I wrote the book that a, a, a true compliment for an author is that, oh, it sounds just like you. But imagine if you're reading somebody else's words, that's why speechwriters are so valuable. Mm. If, if you see a candidate giving a speech that is clearly not written by them, that they can't deliver because they actually don't believe the words, then it's not authentic. People want to hear you. They actually, you were invited to speak for a reason. So you can't try to pretend to be somebody else. Excellent advice. That's some of the best public speaking advice we've had on the show thus far, I think. Oh, good. Well, finally, I want to know, Dana, if you can share what's next on the horizon for you. What are you working on now that, that you're excited about and they're getting the juices flowing? Well, one of the things I write about in the book is that I'm a planner, but sometimes to a default, right? So every time I plan, <laughs> something else happens. Mm. And so I'm kind of afraid to think about what's next because <laughs> uh, that means that what I have right now, which I really am enjoying, um, is coming to an end. But mm. all things come and go, right? So I loved writing. And I feel like I gave everything I had to say. I said everything I had to say in the book that I wrote, but um, maybe there's some more to pull from, some more nuggets. And it was a solitary process, but not unhappily so. So I might do some of that. I'm going to get a chance to go to Africa. And don't forget, you know, in the next year and a half, my work-related activities are going to have to be focused on the presidential election, Mm -hmm. which is going to be very important. Absolutely. Well, Dana, we appreciate you taking the time. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. So thank you so much for for taking time out to share the experience of writing the book and, and what you've learned along the way. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Dana's book for me was a joy to read. I think I finished it in just a couple of sittings and is filled with practical life and business advice. I think you'll truly enjoy it. To find out more about the book and the links and resources that we talked about today, check out the show notes page for this episode. You'll find all the links at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 088 for episode 88. I encourage you to connect with Dana on Twitter. You can find her at Dana Perino on Twitter. That's at D-A-N-A-P-E-R-I-N-O on Twitter. If you've been enjoying the podcast, I want to ask you to consider rating and reviewing the show either in iTunes or on Stitcher or both. This helps get the podcast noticed. You can go to readtoleadpodcast.com slash iTunes to leave a rating and review there or readtoleadpodcast.com slash Stitcher to do so on that platform. And if you consider the podcast five star worthy, we'll be sure to give you a shout out on a future episode of the show. I want to say thank you to Contact Vibe Have, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from India, who recently left a five star rating and review and calls it a must-listen-to podcast for leaders. Thank you so much. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time for the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read to Lead.